committees that would like to call themselves to order. Like to call the board to order. Call board Thank you guys all for coming. We really appreciate um, the presence from the public as well as all the boards and committees coming tonight to, to kind of talk through what's going on in the town in terms of financial updates. Um, my name is Mark Doctor. I'm the current chair of FinCom. This is the FinCom group uh, that's up here. This is the first of these forums that we're sponsoring here in 2015. <coughs> what I would like to do, if I could, in fact, mm -hmm. Bob, can I encourage yeah, you to, you want me to just do that? Do you want me to do it? Okay. Yeah, if you would mind, sure. Thank you. Here's what I suggest we, we are going to cover tonight. First thing is I'd like to give a little bit of a, an overview of the budget process that we're going through um, and kind of the different steps, the different meetings that will be coming up. There are a whole series of public meetings, and we encourage your, your input at all of those meetings. Um, Sharon and uh, a little bit Bob are going to do um, a little bit of an update on town finances for fiscal 15 and some recent activities that have come in that impact 16 uh, related to bonds and health care. Uh, John is going to talk a little bit on school budget. Uh, Bob will talk a little bit about town budget, and then uh, there are uh, one very important issue uh, related to the schools, a more immediate need on activities, which John will talk about. And then uh, Bill in the back uh, wanted to talk about something that the, the cemetery, cemetery board uh, is planning to bring forward for April. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll have a wrap up. And what I'd like to do tonight is encourage this to be a very open forum. So as we're having the discussions, Please feel free to, to ask questions and go through it. Um, the, the mission for tonight is to kind of have everyone share their thoughts and opinions. And to, uh, as well, we have some issues that the different boards are going to vote on. I know that FinCom has a couple of issues to vote on for an upcoming warrant. The selectmen, I think, are going to vote on closing a warrant in a town meeting. And I guess those are the two activities coming up. So, okay, from there, next one to the, to the overview. They're going to roll out the animation. <laughs> So let me tell you first of all, kind of what does FinCom do? Um, we do many things, but our role right now is to review a place. Yeah, let's get some more chairs. This is great. This is the best turnout I think we've ever had here. Can we do that? Thank you. and we report to town meeting. So we are a, an appointed body that comes in and comes back with our recommendations on financial issues, reporting back to town meeting. Specifically, next one, um, the town budget comes from the town manager, it's reviewed by the finance committee, and then FinCom actually presents its recommendation to town meeting. Um, and that happens in the April time frame, the annual town meeting. Next one. What we also do is each fiscal year, um, we set a budget guidance. Uh, that we believe makes sense for the town and for the schools. We give them that number and we established that uh, late last year. Um, for fiscal 17, it's about $1.7 million of funds that come from cash reserves. Let me explain that for a second as well. The town, and, and actually Sharon's going to kind of go through more of this, so I won't, I won't spoil the thunder. Um, there are revenues that the town has and we face certain costs that we have control over and other costs that we don't. Um, some of the things like health care can't really have very good control over. Um, we also look at it and we have the ability to uh, have taxes come in, the property taxes, there are some other taxes, or there are some sources of revenues that come in. But that's all pretty limited. So each year we look through and we set budget guidance for what we think is, again, prudent for the town and the activities to make sure that the town can provide the services that the residents are, are asking for. So that's kind of the process that now is coming together the schools, are, uh, through the school committee, are going through a budgeting process. Uh, the superintendent has given them a recommended budget. The school committee is going through it in depth. Uh, there are it's at least one more meeting on that, I think, before the vote. Is that correct? Yes. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow night. Um, and then the town is going through a similar process with the Board of Selectmen and going through uh, all of, through the different departments, the budget recommendations, go through the selectmen, 
comes back to the town manager. The town manager then puts together a full town budget, submit that to FinCom. FinCom then goes through and we kind of meet with each of the different groups, talk about what's in there, again, review it for fiscal prudence. And then that's the budget uh, as voted by FinCom that goes to town meeting. So that's the process as it goes forward. Uh, from FinCom's point of view, starting February 25th, every Wednesday night, uh, we start meeting and going through these budgets. And again, public, these are all public meetings. The public is welcome to come to all of them. So where are we? Um, generally, and I think I speak for, for the group, um, Frank's doing a good job. We're a top the list of our peer communities in terms of what we're doing. We have reserve funds that right now are in pretty good shape. We've done a lot with regionalization and cost-saving measures. So we've looked at how can we save money? How can we spend less and get more? Um, with the net being that you know, for every dollar we spend, we're getting more than a dollar in resources back. Uh, in fact, we're the example that is used by nearby communities for how to do it better. Um, we have an exemplary bond rating, which Bob will talk about in a moment. Triple um, A, probably better than the US government, I would say. Um, and, and the town officials are asked to speak at the Mass Municipal Association meetings and other meetings, again, because of the, the uh, progressiveness that we've done. Um, one of the things that we've talked about quite a bit at the recent FinCom meetings, and it's come up in, in a lot of other meetings that we've had as a group, I'd say over the last several years, um, has been the need for us to kind of look at where we are with funding and what that means about the choices that the town's able to make. Um, at some point, if costs are rising faster than revenues are, and we're, that's the, the point where we are, we have to face a choice and set priorities, either decreasing services or increasing revenues or, or anything in between as well. But the cost of providing services is going up faster than 2.5% per year. Prop 2.5 is the legislation in place that limits property tax increases to that level. If our costs are going up faster than 2.5%, um, and our revenues aren't going up, then we have to face real cuts in services. Um, there are some changing demographics going on in the town. Uh, as population ages, that could require more services. We have a series of state unfunded mandates that require additional resources. Um, and the world realities are putting new strains on the system. I can talk about it from a kid's point of view in terms of drug, stress, and other things that weren't really part of, of budget processes uh, when these were thought of in the so there's some real needs that are coming upon us. Reading has really found ways to consolidate services, to regionalize the activities, as I mentioned, and to get more than a dollar's worth of services out of every dollar that we spend. And that's really to be commended. It's really exceptional. <coughs> that said, we're getting to the point now where we're at the bone. The 2016 budget, in some cases, is inadequate and requires some meaningful cuts. And we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of what's going on. That said, fiscal 17 is going to be even more difficult. There'll be some uh, real cuts in services for the town and the schools if things stay exactly as they are. Next slide, please. We have something that's called free cash. And this is a number that gets floated around quite a bit in terms of you know, reserves and you know, what does the town have. Where we are right now, um, our reserves are actually in very good shape. We have about nine and a half of percent of our reserve of revenues in reserve right now. We've had what's called regeneration, which means even though we're spending uh, some of these funds through different activities of the town, unexpected activities, some of that money comes back into the cave. So as much as we're spent, we say we're going to spend $1.7 million in free cash this year, we anticipate some of that will actually come back. So our net, our net spending won't be that high. It's been great in the past years. Our regeneration has been very high, higher than anybody ever expected. That said, a lot of those have been kind of one-time events. If we can continue the one-time events, that would be wonderful. But it's not that likely. It's likely that we're gonna, we're gonna lose some of that. We're gonna start cutting into our reserves. The FinCom established a policy, I don't know how many years ago, but a long time ago, to hold at least 5% of our revenues in reserve funds. Basically a rainy day fund, if you will. Um, but we're believing at this point that that's too low a number. That reserve number should be higher, six, 7% perhaps. Um, for a number of reasons. The biggest ones being, number one, it maintains very low borrowing rates. So when we go out to raise money and have bonds, um, we're getting the lowest rates. And Bob, in fact, is going to talk about how low some of those rates can be. The other is it's a buffer against extraordinary expenses, things that we haven't counted on, things that happen uh, that we <coughs> need to deal with as a town. So there's a reason to have a very strong set of reserves. And, and we're, in fact, uh, as a FinCon, we've been discussing what that right level should be, and soon I think we'll come to a, a consensus on what that number should be. 
there are some strong needs coming to the town right now that we think are going to be reducing our reserve levels. So there'll be some one-time capital projects, one of which you're going to hear about tonight. Um, we have been using funds to buffer the operating budget. This means is that if we um, simply said, okay, we can only raise uh, activity by 2.5% per year, that's the revenue increase, that would mean that each year we have real cuts in service because we have health care, we have wage and step increases, we have a variety of things that have increased more than 2.5%. So what we've been able to do is we've been able to take some of our reserve funds and use them for the operating budget. Our concern is that as we're getting into 16 and 17, that's starting to change pretty dramatically for the town. So as much as it looks like 9.5% right now in reserves, it's very likely that uh, by the end of 16, it'll be closer to 8, based on some of the things that we're going to be discussing tonight. And fiscal 17, probably closer to that 7 level, uh, which is kind of a number I don't think we're going to want to go much below. Back in 1982, a measure called Prop 2.5 came through in Massachusetts. Um, and there are some interesting things I want to bring up about it. And, and just to be clear, I'm not advocating a policy in terms of what the town should be spending its money on. But rather, I want to make sure that everyone understands that the resources we have today are limited. We're using them in appropriate ways, and we're getting to the point where those reserves are going to be tight and some decisions are going to have to get made. So what does Prop 2.5 do? It limits the increases in the property tax levy to a maximum of 2.5% per year on the existing stock of housing, or of, uh, of buildings and housing. Um, what it does is it forces local governments to really set priorities, uh, to decide to spend less in real terms each year versus an override. Uh, to get additional revenue into the system. That's one of the things that it forces. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a very effective mechanism of doing that. However, it also sets very arbitrary limits on the ability to raise revenues without considering what the actual costs are of providing services. So as the cost of services go up, Prop 2.5 doesn't have any mechanism for looking at that. It's a, it's a kind of a set fee and structure. Um, it also makes local governments very heavily dependent on state aid. And what we've learned, especially recently, is that's not something that we can count on. Um, and certainly not increases in that number. We cannot count on that. So our capability at this point has, has been sharply limited. History for this town has shown, and for other towns as well, that every approximately decade or so, an adjustment needs to be made. And an override in, in the past couple of decades has taken place to kind of reset things a little bit. Um, we're at roughly year 11 or 12 in that process right now. So it, it may be that it's time for the town to have a discussion about this. Bottom line from this is that the town needs to make clear its priorities for services. And it's our, our feeling that if we're going to maintain services at current levels, some new sources of revenue or an override are going to be needed probably in the next 12 to 18 month time frame. So again, the point of me bringing it up here is that we're having these discussions we want to share it with, with you folks to understand kind of where things are, are heading. And again, it's, a ser it's time for the town to be setting priorities on what those spending issues need to be. And if the current levels of services are desired, then the town's going to have to look at new revenue sources with an override being one of those potential items. Mr. Brown. You forgot uh, new growth, Mark, in your two and a half. Uh, I, so uh, I didn't want to get into too much detail. There is an opportunity for new growth. So there is additional revenue that can come in from new growth. So as we have new housing projects, new activities in town, that's additional funding that comes in beyond just the 2.5%. That's correct. So I didn't, I, I didn't want to confuse it, but I didn't mean to leave it out. I apologize. I'll correct every time. Let me stop for a moment. <coughs> Comments or questions? Any reasonably clear? Is, it, is uh, a demo, a knockdown and rebuild considered new growth or no? It, when we do, because um, it's not, you not when you knock down existing stock and rebuild, is that new growth or is that just? I assume that goes to the new valuation, then that's where it goes. But, um, whatever you do to your house, whether it's small or large, and the, assess and the assessors say you've made a change, oh, that's, that's new growth. New growth. Oh, so so you might change. add a porch or add a deck, and that might be a tiny amount of new growth. You might knock your house down and build a huge one. That's more new growth. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question regarding the new growth. Doesn't the new growth from new housing 
project also put more people in the town, which puts additional demands on the existing systems? Yes. And do we have to have a formula to sort of figure out the money coming in versus the additional demands? Absolutely. New growth is there are new people coming into town, new activities coming into town. The expectation is that they're going to be requiring the same services, or in some cases, additional services. So as much as we, we gain from that in terms of the revenue, there's also a cost associated with it. Yeah, Mr. Brown. Uh, interesting point. The population <coughs> running in the last 50 years has not gone up about 5,000 people. So you can say new people coming in, bringing problems. They were here 50 years ago. <laughs> Some of them were, yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, when we started talking about the kindergarten, it was 18, 18 something when we started talking about kindergarten. So. Very good. Okay, if there are no further questions, <laughs> which I think is the case for comments, let me turn it over to Sharon to talk a little bit about kind of an update on this. Cash and all that. Yes, please. This, um, I don't know if you need this, but this is just kind of about the meetings that are happening in January and February. Yeah, please. Actually, worth going through just for a second. So the, the school committee is meeting tomorrow. <laughs> yes, is that the last meeting and then the vote? Tomorrow is the public hearing on the school budget. Okay. So folks, if you're interested, that would be a great meeting to attend, 7 o'clock, superintendent's office. Absolutely. Great. Selectmen are, is this the right calendar? So the 27th? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. And then town manager pulls it all together, brings it to FinCom, and then FinCom uh, every Wednesday. So what we're proposing actually is the 25th and the 4th would be the town budget, the 11th for school and facilities. That's all right? That's it's changed. We, we, moved, we added one more meeting, so I guess we should ask if that's possible. Sure. Thank you. And then the 18th, we'll look at Warren articles, the whole budget, um, and then on the 25th, we'll vote on the budget and Warren articles. Again, all public meetings here. Thank you. So this is um, a, a snapshot of where we are currently with our reserves. We started off on um, fiscal 15 with just over $8.5 million of free cash. And you can see the uses that we had in November and January that were authorized. I put in a unknown for February town meeting because I wasn't quite clear what um, the school was going to ask for, or if it was even going to be free cash. I kind of left it there as unknown. I estimated two million dollars for April town meeting. That's the 1.7 that we were authorized, as well as an estimate for the shortfalls in state aid and health insurance currently. Um, so that's probably overestimated, but just to be conservative. Then we have our stabilization fund at just over one and a half million, and then what's remaining in our FinCon reserves is about 115,000. Um, so just shy, just shy of 7.8 million dollars, and approximately 9.5 percent of our estimated net available revenues. And I just want to mention um, we did do a borrowing recently, and our reserve position, being as strong as it is, really yielded amazing rates, rates I wouldn't even think were possible. So there is something to be said for keeping a very strong reserve position. I mean, I think we got 1.49, was it? Yeah, I mean, unbelievable rate. Um, that's huge savings that you, know, you get when you have a AAA rating, and it's not an easy rating to come by for a, town, a small town. It just helps the need to mention that. These are our projected revenues for fiscal 16 and 17. We did talk about it in October. I figured I would revisit them. They haven't really changed except for in the local revenues, and I'll talk about that. Um, currently in fiscal 15, we are um, at 51% of our um, budget, um, so we are doing well in the current year and on target. Um, but we do look at that to kind of assess whether or not some of our revenues could go up or down. You know, if, we're, if we say we're having a shortfall in the current year, we're going to try and look and, and assess what the number is for the next year, make sure we're making appropriate investment. Property taxes, nothing is changing since we spoke last. Um, it's really the 2.5% plus new growth, so it comes up to 3.3. You saw the actual budget, it would say 5.3, and that's because the debt exclusion is in there. The debt exclusion is pretty much a wash. It's, you know, the revenue comes in and goes up to the debt service. It doesn't really help us pay for anything in addition. Um, local revenues is where it's, um, I made a few changes. Um, under charges for services, we have a new revenue that I didn't account for the last time that we met. Um, we have a new um, regionalized housing coordinator that we're sharing with three communities. Um, and so the way DOR advised me to show this was for us to show the whole salary as part of our budget, 
and show a revenue coming in from the other communities. But last time we met, I neglected to add that in, so I apologize. And so I added that um, figure into our local revenue. And when I was doing my review of where we stand in fiscal 15, I noticed that our interest income was far outpacing our, um, our budget, fiscal 15, and so I felt the need to bump that up. And I questioned the treasurer what's going on. We've been pretty flat. We've been kind of just mining in interest. And she had made an option to move a fair amount of money to a different type of investment that yields a higher interest rate, 0.75, and I think we're getting 0.2. Still very conservative mm -hmm. investment, but it's yielding us much more money, and so I increased um, the income for um, interest as well. About $150,000 worth of changes, but still every dollar counts mm -hmm. and worth mentioning. And I had prior increased excise tax as we talked about. Fiscal 14 came in well above what we had projected and wanted to kind of get more on target with what we really could be. State aid, we were advised to go with the 2.5% because all these are guessing games. And obviously, FinCom said they would cover any shortfall. And, and what we are hearing is that we probably won't get to and a half. So there, there will be some sort of a, a shortfall there. And transfers from available funds is going down. And that's largely because every year we um, bring down our use of sale of real estate by $50,000 just to get that money to last longer. So that's the decrease you see there. So those are the numbers for fiscal 16 and 17. Here's some good news that we have um, currently is the RFP for the health insurance came in. Um, my uh, came in with an 8.2 percent, which is much nicer than the numbers that we're hearing for estimates, and it looks like some of the other bids were not so nice. So we're getting to stay where we are with Maya at an 8.2 percent increase, and the budget was at 8 percent, so not very far off where we put it. So that's nice. We also um, will be getting another quote from Maya in February, and hopefully they'll be as nice as next year. Chapter 90, we got some, you know, the new governor gave us the additional $300,000 for road work in this current year, which is lovely um, and very much appreciated. <laughs> um, and then fiscal 16 state aid, um, we're hearing $25 a student is all that Reading will probably get, and that could be a $150,000 shortfall. So that's why I kind of went to the $2 million, which is probably on the high side, but you know, depending on where that number really falls, that's, you know, conservative. And this is how it would look for fiscal 16 and 17. Um, when you take our overall revenues and you back out our accommodated costs, your offering budgets can only go up by 2.75% um, or 1.85 for um, fiscal 17 when we're using just the 1.7 of cash. So um, that's pretty much where we stand at this point. With the changes that we've made to the budget, it's a little bit increased from the 2.5 we were looking at back in October. Oops. Sharon and Bob, to what extent uh, the where's the breaking point on the bond rating? So we're at we're at nine and a half percent. We get a triple A bond rating. Uh, at what point do they say you know that's, that's going to fall? And and what what's the time frame for that? So we went down. Would they give us a little bit of time to recover, or does it? Do they make a correction immediately? I mean, and, and actually, another question: To what extent does that matter? What do, do? It would be nice to know what what significant borrowing we're looking at in the future to the extent that that really matters. What our bond rating is in the next five years? Or yeah, our most significant borrowing was done last Thursday. Um, we didn't borrow the full amount for the library project. We borrowed about 11 million out of 13 or 14 total, so that's a big chunk done. Um, there are no other substantial capital projects approved on the immediate horizon, so our borrowing will be much smaller. Um, to answer all the other questions you had, it, it's it's an art; it's not a science. Um, we're rated on seven different categories by the rating agencies. Some of them we have control over; some of them we don't. One of them, for instance, is demographics and economics of your area. We can't do much about that. Um, we received a perfect score on all but one thing of things we can control. And the, the imperfect score was don't use free cash to balance your budget. So we received below, not below average, but below perfect on that. 
and there was some comment about somehow you managed to regenerate it, but it doesn't make any sense why you always do. And that's the thing I always say, so I sort of feel like I know what they're talking about. Um, it's really difficult to quantify answers to your questions, though. Um, we just refinanced some old, uh, and you can see it's not too old, wood end, uh, Barrows debt, um, some of the water treatment buy-in debt, and uh, we refinanced approximately three and a half million dollars worth of debt, and we saved five hundred thousand dollars worth of interest because of our rating and because of the interest rate environment. You know, who knows how much? Um, a few years ago, we refinanced the high school debt, and we saved three and a half million dollars of interest. That's a huge amount, and that three and a half million is not three and a half that went towards our budgets. That just means the residents and the taxpayers didn't have to pay that much more for the high school because it's excluded from the tax rate. So, you know, there, there's a couple tangible examples of numbers where we've saved. Would it have been three million instead of three and a half with a much worse rating? It's hard to say, but possibly. Um, you know, your bond rating is not something you want to be a slave to, absolutely. Um, you want to run the town the most efficiently you can, and the bond rating is secondary. However, a week ago, I might not have been willing to say that in public before we borrowed, you know, $15 million. But now I don't mind. So as long as the board is selected and authorized, you would take the bond uh, right around the lunch. I haven't done that in a while. But the, an the answer is that none of this is math. It's all, it's all art. Um, I, I don't... You know, for those of you that know, know, don't know, Chuck knows, I used to be in that business, so I know the ins and outs. And absolutely, we should not be a slave to how they see us. That doesn't matter. It's helpful, but we need to run ourselves the way we need to run ourselves, and then the bond rating follows as far as I'm concerned. I have a question. Sorry to change presentations, Sharon, but um, on the slide where you had the um, stabilization, mm -hmm. I think if we can just go back to those numbers, it indicated that that didn't, ex that didn't include sort of special funds. Yeah, there's, there's different stabilization funds that are earmarked for certain things. We have a smart growth stabilization, which is earmarked for road and sidewalk work that's coming from the 40R money that comes in. When we get the 40R money, we just kind of move it from free cash into that um, stabilization fund. And that's traditionally what we've been using it for. And then we have a safe buyback stabilization. Mm -hmm. Um, which when we put money in there, it's so that we can pay for sick buyback when people retire um, that for our grandfather did who um, actually got that benefit, which uh, we were, you know, none of us currently get it. So um, people who've been here a long time who get that benefit, people who are newer don't have that benefit. So that's something that's going away. And we're very, the balance in that account is very, very low because no sooner do we put it in, somebody gives us a notice they're retiring that is getting it and, and the money goes out. It, so we don't maintain very much of a balance in that one. The, I believe the um, smart growth has $353,000 in it, it's not big money. Um, and and it, it just because it is in a stabilization that it's earmarked for something does not mean that you can't um, vote to use it for something else. But with all stabilization funds, it's a two-thirds vote to get it out of there and use it for whatever it is that you can even though we earmarked it doesn't mean we can't touch it for something else if, if we want to. So. so how much in total is in the special designated funds? The what? How much is in total is in the designated funds at 350, but the lowest must be? I think that the sixth one is only like $20,000. I mean, we're talking very small dollars. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever stays in that fund for whatever reason. As soon as we put something in, it comes out. You also have many other reserve funds, certainly plenty of them in the school uh, department. I've never added up you know, revolving funds, you know, yeah. different funds. I've never added it all up. Sale of real estate's another one um, that we have, as I recall, over 700,000. We sold a couple single family lots. You can see we've been using that in a long period of time for real estate. But the reason that those aren't included on this slide is they all have a limited amount of use. You can use them for a variety of things, but not for anything. Mm -hmm. So sale of real estate can be used for three things. So it can't fund an operating budget. It could do capital, it could do uh, pension obligations or long-term obligations or debt. But you can't really include it as cash because it's not got the same purpose as cash. So that's why it's, all those things aren't shown. Ben, Ben. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. 
for Sharon. Sharon, how much free cash did we regenerate from fiscal year 14? We regenerated a million dollars. Actually, over the last few years, we regenerated a million dollars. Each year? On our spending. Each year? Each year. Each year for the last like, three or four years, I think it's been a million dollars. We've gone up each year. So we had budgeted, like, to use 1.7? Mm -hmm. And so, really, if you net those together, we really probably use seven hundred thousand. It's a little bit less than one point seven, actually, last year that we had authorized. Because I think sometimes when we realize we've got, sometimes we reduce it at town meeting, so that it could be even less. I don't recall the numbers though. And I think to the point we were talking about before, uh, we've we've done very well in regenerating funds, much more than uh, was planned or anticipated or forecast. Um, but they seem each time to be a one-time event, and we've been lucky to have a number of one-time events. Uh, not sure how many more of those we can find. Yeah, as many as we can are great, but I'm not sure how many we can find. Other questions? John? Mark, you might also uh, make the point that uh, some of that regeneration comes from the prudent use of, those, of the operating funds by the school and the town. It's not merely one-time events, but mm -hmm. Prudent stewardship of the funds that are given to operating uh, bodies and they're used to help um, re replenish uh, that, that fund. So it's, there are one time events, but that's not as long as. Yeah, no, great point. In fact, last year we actually had a, a net change of $2 million in total. Yeah. I think the schools gave back about a half million dollars yeah, in funds million. that weren't being used. I think the way it broke up, we had a million over for revenues. So we collected a million more in revenues. We spent a million less in expenses. And then all the uses it nets out to increasing your free cash by a million. That's how right. it worked out. Yeah. Right. And to John's point, you know, all of the, the school department, town departments all returned funds that weren't going to be spent and put right back into the budget. So, you know. And it's always something different. I mean, you know, right. remember the first year I was here, we had a very mild winter and we turned back. Two hundred fifty thousand of seven hundred. Unless we didn't. Normally, moving all of our extra to it, so it was almost a million dollars effect yes. just from that, and, and that doesn't happen every year. Which means it's so snowing in the year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 we, we don't talk about that. <laughs> Any other comments before we move on? If I could just make a housekeeping comment, somewhere around here, there's a sign-in sheet. Uh, for purposes of open meeting law, we need to make sure everybody signs in. So there it is, if you Please. just don't mind doing that during the evening. Thanks. Can you pass it over to the second not eligible for the door prize, that's Same door prize as always, Bill. Um, I just wanted to clarify, too, that that money that was sent back by the schools last year was not because there was extra money, money budgeted per se, but there was a special ed placement that did not happen. So that is where some of that, you have to leave room for special ed placements and other costs that might be incurred. And when it doesn't happen, the schools gave it back. It wasn't because the schools got too much money and they didn't use it. <laughs> With that, why don't we move on to a quick discussion of first the school budget and then the town budget for the 16th. John, you don't have to worry about my slide. That's just yeah. a placeholder. Sorry. Do you want to do it? Okay. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> so I'll be brief because um, we've been spending, as Mark said, a significant amount of time. Um, going over the, the, um, the superintendent's recommended budget. And so the, the process on, with the school <coughs> department is that there are, there are three meetings where we go over the different cost centers of, of the budget. Um, then tomorrow night, uh, there'll be a public hearing by, by statute. You have to have a public hearing for the budget. Um, and then the, the school committee has submitted over 100 questions on the budget, which uh, Martha Seiber has been, has been answering um, and those will begin to be answered tomorrow night. That probably will continue into Monday night, uh, where the school committee is scheduled to take a vote. And then I, I know that date's wrong now, it's the 11th, not the 18th. But um, then the, the budget is turned over to uh, the town manager, and, and then uh, we would be presenting that to the, the finance committee. So that's, that's where we are with the process. Um, 
we are we are prior to the uh, the presentation that Sharon had made tonight because I, I know now that it's a little bit more. So what we um, following FinCom's guidance um, with the two and a half percent increase, the budget we were looking at was a uh, forty one million three hundred fifty thousand dollars, which um, compared to the as you can see compared to the, the FY. 15 budget is a two and a half percent. If you took le this current year's budget and did a level service budget, which is to just assume everything moving forward uh, with the contractual increases um, and other known costs uh, increases such as special education, transportation, things like that, we were approximately $849,000 short. So that's where the basis of the level service 4.7 for seven budget came in. So essentially we're presenting to the school committee two budgets. Um, the two and a half percent budget and the 4.7 percent budget. Um, the drivers to the budget, um, none of them here are, are surprises. Is your salary and benefit obligations for the collective bargaining agreement? We'll be entering the second year of a collective bargaining agreement with all of our unions, um, and any non-union salary and benefit increases. Um, we also had some anticipated increases in special education transportation costs. Um, and district special education tuition. One of the big factors in the development of this budget is our circuit breaker reimbursement decrease in, um, for next year uh, because we had a decrease in the number of students that qualified for the threshold to receive that reimbursement from the state. Um, so we had a dip in the number of students that were actually in out of district placements, um, which resulted in, a, in less circuit breaker. So that, that's an amount of funding that we need, would need to make up um, in the budget. And then we are anticipating some increases in natural gas costs. Um, we, we are also, we're going to need to have a conversation also about, there will be some anticipated increase, um, not only with a new contract, but with the fact that um, if we do go online with modulars, uh, there will be a slight increase in, in utility costs as well, and we'll talk more about that when we get into the modular presentation. Um, so you can see this is a five cost center. We have uh, five cost centers. The administration cost center, which is the smallest of your car center, that, that's actually decreasing uh, by 1.3%. Um, regular day, which is the bulk of the cost center, which is your instructional staff and, and anything really dealing with the regular education side of the schools, teachers and, and principals and secretaries, parents, regular ed, paraeducators, um, that's about a 3% increase. That's really driven by salary. Um, special education, is, which is the, the next largest cost center, um, is about a 2.3% increase. Um, and then school facilities is, is pretty much at, at a 0% increase. And then district-wide programs, which is athletics, extracurricular activities, district-wide technology, which is not instructional technology, and health services that are not special education related is 4.8%. Most of the increases, again, are driven by, um, by the the salary adjustments. So I mentioned earlier that we had to come up with a list of over 850, about $850,000 in reductions. We've had long discussions with the school committee during our presentations about um, the, the reductions that we had to make. Uh, several of these do have an impact um, on the classroom um, or, or other areas directly related to the classroom. Uh, we, we unfortunately do have to make some personnel cuts in this recommended budget, and that's the reduction in regular ed paraeducators, um, which provide non-instructional uh, support uh, during the school day for, for teachers and, and staff. Um, we are proposing also in this budget that we uh, increase athletic and extracurricular user fees um, for students. They currently do pay user fees at the high school to play sports and to participate in drama um, and band. Um, and we also had to uh, increase our offsets from the revolving accounts to make up primarily some of the difference in that circuit breaker decrease that I was mentioning earlier, uh, but also um, to pay for some of the salary increases and in some of the line items. The budget that we have presented, um, and I think, I think Mark, you were alluding to this earlier, is, is a budget that has restructured areas that are more one-time restructuring. Um, we tried, our goal was not to make cuts in the classroom, um, and this budget succeeds. However, going into FY17, 
there are no other restructuring efforts that we see in the horizon that we would be able to do. So the next round of reductions if budget revenue stay the same would be to, to for the classroom. Um, so that is that is something that's a real real concern. So that that pretty much is a summary of, of where we are right now in the budget. Thank you. Questions or comments? And where can folks find these back? slides? Where are these slides available? Um, these have been, we've been using these, presenting them, so we've been, they're on our district website. Great. Right. There's a question in the back. Uh, it, with these numbers, where would this put us in um, amongst the rest of the state and where people spend? Um, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't be able to calculate that. I mean, right now we are ranked in the lower uh, quadrant in, when compared to other states. Um, but uh, other other towns, sorry, but other towns. Um, it's based on end of year reports, and we would not have this end of year report for uh, for all the other communities for a couple of years. But you know, right now we are in the lower lower quartile. And do you, do you think that I mean, I think there's a high expectation for excellence in the schools here. Do you think that that could be maintained at this level, being in the lower? We're in like what the lower quartile. Um, we're currently about 305 out of uh, 325. Um, no, we would not be able to continue the services and the educational programs that we have well, with this level of budget next year, a year from now, in FY17. And at what point would you propose to try and structurally change that? To, to get more money to, to, offer, to offer more services? I, I would say, you know, we're at the point now, in FY17, we would not be able to continue these services. That's our question in the middle here. Okay, yes, please. Dr. Jordan, does this budget take into account potential staff increases if the recommendation of the school committee for additional classrooms at the three elementary school passes? We, um, we will not need to increase staff for the module classrooms. We would not need to increase staff. Um, there is an additional teacher at Joshua, for Joshua Eaton as part of this budget, but it is restructuring other positions to, to fund that teacher. It is not an additional position in the budget. And at Barrow, for example, how, um, three full day or three Right, so, so what, what is going to be happening if the modular classrooms are, are approved is that there's going to be some movement of teachers throughout the district. So it won't be adding teachers, it will be moving existing teachers. Thank you. So a question over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I had a quick follow-up on this gentleman's questions about existing struggles and just does this budget and your estimation, this committee's estimation, is it able to adequately deal with the existing issues that Um, I mean, it, there, there are certainly supports that we do not have that we would, we would love to put in place for students that are struggling. Um, you know, our class sizes at the elementary, other than the current kindergarten that Joshua Eaton are in, in fairly decent shape. Um, you know, class sizes as a whole in, across the district are in fairly decent shape, other than those. So, so if you use that as one of your, your variables, that, that's fine. Um, where I think we fall short is providing those non-special education supports for struggling students. Um, we've been able in this budget to keep the level that we have of tutors. Um, we are not reducing tutors in this budget, but certainly we could use more supports, particularly at the um, elementary school level. So no, we, 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 don't, we aren't able to go with additional. Uh, that yes, we do, but that's that's a tuition-based program. So that has nothing to do then with this no. budget. No, no, it doesn't. You're nodding. I'm saying. Oh, but okay. So it has nothing. It's a revolving account it's that's tuition-based. So, okay. I I think that probably more to answers to your question, and maybe tonight is not the right night, but. I'm not sure, but I just, from like a bigger picture, I just want to use one example and I'll be quick. So when you look at um, how we 
you know, continue to be below the per pupil. There are things that we have wanted to do, and I was previously on the school committee from 2003 to 2010, and there were things that we have wanted and felt were important to do that we have not been able to do. Whether you can pick, uh, you know, instructional specialists, um, curriculum specialists, uh, assist point five assistant principals at the elementary schools, which is pretty consistent with other districts, or a science curriculum that hasn't been updated since 1996. So, you know, and maybe tomorrow night's about a night to get into those details, but. Yeah, I, I didn't go, I'm going with what we're doing right now. Right. I'm not going beyond that, because right. that's a whole nother conversation, yes. <laughs> and I just, to take two seconds to respond, I've been to a number of the meetings before, I'm just you're using the framing of the question just to add in to the concerns around the larger resource issue we'll call it the town. That's all. Yeah, I think super superintendent, I don't know if this is important for it, but my only observation, just something for consideration, is that um, you know, I think that there's a growing gap in between the expectation for the schools and the amount of funding that you have at your at your reach. And just like anything, you have to pay for, for what you want. <coughs> I would pay more for it. Others may not Just to be, to be clear on that too, the reason that we had the early part of the discussion tonight is that that is where we are as a town. And it, if there are priorities that we're not able to take care of or we want to maintain uh, level services, we're at a point in the budget where we're, it's a problem. Right? And the reason we're bringing it to the floor is it's time for the, the town to have that discussion in our estimation. Bob, do you want to do a quick update on Townsite? Pretty much the same as what you said. <laughs> <laughs> um, although our process is different and our details are quite different, the conclusion really is very similar to, to what John described. Um, <clears throat> we don't use the same terminology. Our side of the house is not nearly as data-driven in the industry as schools, which is really unfortunate. So we have a hard time comparing. We've attempted to sort of start that statewide over the last 10 years and it's failed miserably. Um, but what I can say is our department heads brought in what I would describe as a level service budget. Um, we're about half as big as the schools budget wise. We had a, we had a $22 million budget. Um, the school budget was 800,000 under level service and so were we. So even though we're half as large, our level service gap is pretty large. They actually brought in a budget that was a million dollars out of balance, but some of that I wouldn't describe as level service. It's new things. It's, it's really nice to have things. Um, where we are in the process is the selectmen have had two public meetings. Uh, last night, I think, was the second one. Um, next Tuesday night, um, I present the balance budget, which I completed today. It's a draft budget. I'll discuss it with the selectmen. We may make, make some changes. Um, but to cut from what was requested, including 150,000 of nice to have things, did take a million dollar reduction. Um, I would agree with the superintendent that FY16 is tolerable. FY17 will be very, very difficult. And one of the reasons it's especially tolerable for, uh, for the town side is we are extremely fortunate, and it was through a lot of hard work, that we got a five year federal grant for our CASA. Um, that saved us between 200 and $250,000 a year for the next five years. So if you think of the effect of $200,000 on a $22 million budget, you get the idea that, you know, that may well have saved four or five jobs right there. Um, that's something we can count on for the next few years. But it's, it's shock to the system in terms of taking away expenses only happens once. So that was the benefit of FY16. It's already taken those expenses away, so FY17 will have to get another good happy surprise of 200000 to be anywhere as near close to offering services that this town would like. Um, and I'll just, I'll just conclude with one remark. There's, um, there's an unseen and growing population in this town, generally speaking, elderly. Um, go to a council on aging meeting sometime, and it'll make the school community seem like, you know, rosy days. Um, the elderly in this community have some very difficult issues, health care being one of them, access to health care being another. Um, we work very closely with the schools on issues such as uh, mental health and substance abuse prevention and so on. It's not just a school kid issue in this town. It's, a, it's an every resident issue. 
Um, we're very fortunate in the area grants, both the schools and the town, to receive some. But we're really at a tipping point in the next 12 months of what does this town really want to be and what are they willing to pay for? We will provide whatever service they're willing to pay for. Um, everyone in the you know, schools and town has done a heroic job for the last few years in creating value where the money wasn't there. But I agree with John um, that we're finished. Uh, FY17 will be the, be the roosting. Um, you know, if we don't find new revenues for FY17 or we get some other amazing one-time things that we can't know right now, um, we're not going to have the same level of municipal services. And uh, Mark alluded to something earlier, which is pretty important. Um, a couple of us in the room went to a presentation last week on the demographics of the town. It's absolutely staggering what this town is supposed to look like in 20 years. Now, you can't budget for 20 years from now, but you have to start thinking about it. Um, the two biggest population growths will be 20 to 35 year olds will be up 24%, and 65 and over will be up 75%. So think of what the demand on your local government for social services for the elderly will look like if that's the population change over the next 20 years. And we want to provide, you know, for that population segment. Um, so we, we really are both in the short run and in the longer run at a time when the community really needs to examine its values and decide what it wants to be. Yeah, um, fiscal, mid-year fiscal cuts were on the budget, uh, were on the horizon for the outgoing governor. Uh, the legislature said no, the incoming governor said no, so they're not on the horizon. Um, as you can see, we got another $300,000 released of road money, which was a bit surprising given the shortfall in the state budget. I think the incoming governor is making a pretty loud statement that it's, that it's an expense problem, and uh, by all indications, they intend to deal with that in-house, if you will. Now, there are some spillover effects that will hit Reading. Um, as Sharon mentioned, we budgeted 2.5% in state aid. We'll probably get what we got the prior year, which is the minimum of $25 per student, which is somewhere in the 1% to 1.5% range, which means we're about 150000 or so short. That's not the end of the world. It's not good news, um, but it's not the half-million-dollar cuts that we'd seen in the past. There's another grant that the police get through dispatch that's becoming a little bit questionable, $50,000 that that may uh, diminish or disappear <coughs> over the next three or four years. But by any other indication, there's no immediate impact to Reading. Um, it, it's a very serious problem at the state, make no mistake about that. Uh, order of magnitude in Reading, it's even hard to imagine. Other, than, But we would have no question that we'd be having huge layoffs if we hit a bump in the road like that. Um, but. What we have to be really careful of, to Mark's point earlier, is we can't relate on state aid but bailing us out. Um, we have to deal with our own problems ourselves. Other comments, questions? Okay. Is, um, when you think of FY17, you talk about the grants. I think one thing that's important to mention we, or, or understand is that we've got some great grants that are going to carry forward. Um, and I know in the school budget, we actually, you know, cut back on some of the money to do more grants. You have to remember that you have a certain capacity to execute the grants and stay in compliance with grants. So I think, you know, when you look forward and say, geez, well, maybe we could get another $200,000 grant in 2017 and take that forward, that may not be a realistic thing to be counting on, you know, because we've gotten some great grants and we just don't have the, um, you know, the personnel capacity to execute the grant. So I think it's important we've done, I don't think people should say, oh, look, they did great, and we should get a couple more of those in next year. It's not gonna happen. Okay. 
Okay, let's move on to the next activity. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, to John. The, the uh, school department has identified a, a significant near-term issue uh, that's been brought to the floor. Uh, this is presented through, obviously, through the school committee. The school committee voted on it. It was presented to Finn uh, last week. And uh, you know, once again, we call it for discussion. So, um, finance committee, this is this pretty similar to what you saw last week, so I do apologize for the I'm doing a few new slides. Um, and I, I won't, uh, there are some slides that I'll just briefly talk about compared to, to last week. Um, I believe there is a memo in the packet that was sent out as well that has a lot more detail. So we are gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the current space needs, the enrollment, which is driving part of this issue. Um, did an analysis of the classroom use need for the next five years. Um, and then Martha's going to talk a little bit about the cost estimates for the modular proposals and the um, operating costs associated with, the, uh, with this proposal. And then certainly we'll take, take questions. Um, this is a timeline um, of where we've been. Um, we were beginning to be aware, we knew we had space problems because this has been an ongoing issue for the last few years. And we knew as the kindergarten registrations were coming in that we, and the census, um, which isn't always 100% of a predictor, but it does give you a pretty good idea of where um, five-year-olds are in the community. Um, we were starting to see that we ha were having a, a, a uh, population enrollment issue in certain parts of town. Um, so once we received the registrations on the 19th, we reported to the school committee on the 22nd uh, what our concerns were and uh, proposed some, some different solutions, um, which then led to, on the 8th of January, the school committee voting to move forward with um, six modular classrooms, which I'll get into in more detail. Uh, tonight, as you know, the, the Board of Selectmen will be voting to close the warrant. And then um, the proposed date for town meeting is the 23rd. If we are not able to secure modular classrooms on that date, we will have to go um, to a lottery um, because we just don't have the, the space for the, the full day kindergarten. And um, I'll be talking to the school committee about that process um, in, the, in the upcoming weeks about the lottery assignment process. So essentially the space needs, um, the immediate space needs for the elementary are driven by the following. We have seen an increase in enrollment in full day kindergarten over the last several years. We've also seen an increase in in-district special education programs over the last several years, which, um, which is a good thing to have our students in district with their peers. Um, it is though, uh, uh, it does use classroom space. This upcoming year, we, we have seen an increase in kindergarten enrollment at Barros and Killam. Uh, the census is showing and our enrollment numbers are showing that we had a higher than ordinary um, population of students in kindergarten, uh, particularly at Barros where we haven't seen this spike um, in, in, a, in a long time. Um, we do have a smaller size classroom at Barros that we've been using as a kindergarten, which now combined with the higher enrollment at Barrows next year, creates a, creates a space problem. We have seen a steady increase in enrollment at Joshua Eaton over the last several years, since 2010-11. So it's been an increase of 46 students overall in the school population <coughs> since 2010 and 11, which has increased the number of classrooms that we've used at Joshua Eaton. It is necessitating us next year to add a grade one teacher at Eaton because our current kindergarten classes are at 24 and 25 and we already know of four or five students coming back from private kindergarten coming back to the Joshua Eaton district next year. So in the budget, as I mentioned earlier, there is a teacher um, in the budget for Joshua Eaton grade one for next year um, that we've uh, restructured from uh, other funds. And we've also had a decrease in art and music classrooms at Barrows, Killam, and Joshua Eaton. When, when Wood End was built and we had five elementary classrooms, one of the things that um, was talked about is that there would be um, dedicated art and music classrooms at the elementary schools. 
that has not uh, unfortunately been the case over the last few years. So here's uh, the full day kindergarten enrollment to, so that you can see um, how, how the percentages have increased. Next year we are anticipating 77% of our <coughs> students um, will be in full day kindergarten. This is a tuition based program. Uh, these families are paying $4,200 to be a part of the, um, of the full day kindergarten program. It has to pay for the other half of the half day program. And that funding goes, which is an offset to our operating budget, um, goes to pay for the staff, um, the, the teachers, the paraeducators, material supplies, a portion of um, the administrator's time, a portion of the different support staff. Uh, all of those things go into the calculation of that, that tuition. Here is the registration as of the December 19th. Um, and you can see uh, this is the original census. Um, you can see that we have 78 students at Farrows next year, 47 at Birch Meadow, you can see along the way, to get us for the numbers that we currently have. So Barrows and Killam are, we're seeing higher, higher numbers than normal. The census is showing that. The other thing that is important to know here is that the numbers are going to change between now and September when school opens. Families are moving into Reading. <coughs> um, it is not uncommon to see this number go up. Um, People will call, and for some reason, we've been trying to contact parents that were in the, in the original census, and they'll call and say, oh, I didn't know about the registration. Um, so we'll see the numbers go up um, to, well, to well over 300. It'll probably be about 310 um, is what the average, 310 to 320 is what we average during, during a, a typical kindergarten year. So we, we're not done yet with, with the numbers on the, on the registration. And that is gonna have an effect on this as well. So when we look at the projected needs, um, you can see that when you take the numbers, it, we're looking at uh, a number of classrooms that we're going to um, need next year. And some of these classrooms, we just do not have um, the space at this point for, for the need in, in these different areas. Um, we're, you know, we're mostly concerned about Barrows, Eaton, and Killam, which is where we are proposing that the modular classrooms go. When you look over the next five years or more, um, what, what we're projecting is that those six classrooms eventually will be needed um, and, and, and we'll solve the, solve the, uh, the short term going into long term space, space needs. So in the actual packet that you have, I did a year by year projection. Um, this, is, this is the net table that shows the, type, the number of classrooms that we're going to need from 2000, I used 2014 as the baseline year. And we're starting at Barrows at a negative one in the current school year because Barrows is using a smaller size classroom, which was never um, a designed to be a kindergarten classroom. It was designed to be a music classroom. But over the last couple of years, we've used it for um, a kindergarten classroom. Before that, we used it for um, the Developmental Learning Center classroom, which we have been transitioning that program over to Birch Meadow um, so that um, the, those students could go to Coolidge when, when they moved to elementary school. So starting at a minus one, um, when you enter the 2015-16 school year, you could see that we're going to need four classrooms at the different schools, two at Barrows, one at Eaton, one at Killam. We will need a fifth classroom when we reach 2019-20. It doesn't mean that the six classrooms will not get used. Um, and right now, we currently have classes occurring on stage at two of our schools, uh, Killam and at Eaton. Um, so those classrooms will be used um, if, if, they're, if, they're, um, if they're approved. Wood End, uh, we, will, we will see an extra classroom over the next few years, but then that will, will go back down um, to neutral in 2019-20. So there's some other issues related to the space. First of all, we have a community impact with this, and that you know what we have heard loud and clear um, throughout this process is that the families with young children are moving to Reading uh, for the quality of the schools and the ability to access full day kindergarten, um, and it's been very clear from those. Another important point, and Martha will talk about this more, is that we currently have an offset to our budget 
um, of about $820,000, which will increase next year to $870,000 um, from the full day kindergarten revolving account to pay for the staffing and, and services of full day kindergarten. Um, if we are not able to provide full day kindergarten for all of the students that want it for next year, then approximately up to 80 students will not access full day kindergarten. Um, that has both an, both an educational impact and a financial impact to our operating budget. And Michael will talk more about that later. We will need to conduct a lottery um, uh, for the schools uh, that we just don't have the space for. Um, without the additional space, what will happen is that students will be assigned half day. Um, but it will cause space issues in 2016-17 because you can put two classrooms into one classroom if they're going, if they're assigned a half day. Um, but then the following year, they go back into full-time classrooms. So the space issue, particularly at Barrows um, and Eaton, is not going to go away. Um, the following year, it comes back. A lot of families um, that may not get full-day kindergarten, they, will, they may seek um, an alternative kindergarten program, private kindergarten, but they will come back in grade one, as we're seeing this year um, with some of the Eaton students that are coming back. Um, we will also have, obviously, budget reductions and staff reductions um, because those teachers in kindergarten level, we will not need as many, many teachers. So there are other issues related to the, the space problem. John, question? Yes. Back, back. Sure. You said there's an offset in your budget related to full day K. Is that, is that expenses in, in excess of revenues? Do I understand you to say that, or is it, is it the opposite? What is, is it revenues from the program in excess of the expenses to conduct it, or is it the reverse? Which way is the offset? The offset helps offset the expenses, but it's not a straight one-to-one -one because some of the expenses are expenses that are there whether we have the kindergarten program or not. So, for example, in the tuition, when we calculate the tuition, Martha, you could probably talk more about this. When we calculate the tuition, we also calculate a portion of, say, the principal salary, the yeah, nurse's right. salary. Those are things we, we can't cut a piece of the nurse. We can't. So, so the proposal is, um, as I mentioned earlier, six modular classrooms, two at Killam, two at Barrows, two at, two at Joshua Eaton. Um, it will address the full day kindergarten enrollment for, for next year. It will address the grade one classroom at Joshua Eaton for next year. Um, and it will address the population bubble that now will be going through Barrows, um, which is that next year's <coughs> kindergarten. It is unclear because we do, we do have census for two, three, and four-year-old populations. But the, the younger they are, the less accurate they are because a lot of families do move into Reading when their children are three and four years old. Um, so right now it's showing that the census is that we have no population bubbles coming through. Um, this will also be part of a multi-step longer term space solution in addressing our elementary and preschool needs. As you know, we have a working group that has been meeting uh, since November um, and they're, they're, they're working on a longer term solution. These modules would become part of that solution. Um, so that it's not like that, they're, that this is just the short term, this will be looked upon as part of the, the longer term solution. One of, the, one of the questions that's come up is because you, know, some, you see an empty classroom at Wood End and you have too many uh, classroom needs at say Joshua Eaton and Barrows, is why not redistrict? So one of the things that we have heard loud and clear also from the community is the, the concept of neighborhood schools, that families are moving to Reading and families are staying in Reading because of the neighborhood elementary school concept. Um, when, when redistricting is done by a school system, it's usually done for a few reasons. One is, is when you're opening or closing a school, which was the case in 2006 when Wood End was built and um, the there was a, an elementary redistricting process that took over a year to do. Um, you also will do, can we do redistricting? You see a dramatic increase, say a, a major housing development, or housing developments are built in one part of town. Um, that's when you also would be in need to do some redistricting. Or if you're going to do desegregation, which in an urban school district, or creating equity and resources or demographics of students. Those usually are the major reasons why you would undergo a redistricting process. It's not something that you want to do every few years um, as a solution to tweak populations. 
Um, it's a very disruptive process for families. Siblings have to be kept in mind because um, if you've got incoming students coming uh, into the school and they already have siblings at the school, you really can't move that family. Um, so you only really can move families that, are, um, that do not have siblings already in the school. You also have to take into consideration bus transportation if they're outside the two miles, um, which is an added expense to the operating budget. Um, so there are a lot of things that are factors that are taken into consideration when you're trying to redistrict. We actually have been doing something similar to that over the last few years. School committee has given me authority over the last few years to do what's called the superintendent's option, where any new kindergarten family moving in um, or any new family moving into Reading, have, I have the ability to move them to another school outside of their district if they're within the two miles. Um, so we have done that as a way to balance class sizes um, as much as possible across the district. So it, it is, it is a, a process that works, but it it's only can be done in certain, certain situations. Um, the other piece about this is that redistricting is not a process that can be completed in the next five months. Um, it is a, a multi-month process. It usually takes over a year to do, um, and it would be very disruptive to families. So you, you need to do redistricting for the right reasons, and the, this really isn't one of the reasons why you, would, why you would do that type of redistricting. So I'm going to now go over to the modular presentation. Um, and we, we just got these site plans this afternoon. Um, and so we, last week, Martha and I, we walked around with um, AI3, who is an architect that is, has a pretty good understanding of our elementary schools, has done some work with us in the past on those. We also w walked around with a vendor uh, who uh, specializes in the construction of modular classrooms. And um, w someone from the, the engineering department uh, because yeah, access to utilities is certainly one of the factors that we need to consider when we're placing modules. And right now, these are just uh, proposed locations. Certainly, we are going to be working with um, town officials, fire police, um, CPDC, um, DPW, to um, you know, come up with the, the correct and best space for these. One of the things we have to consider with modular classrooms is location to utilities. And so um, we kept that in mind with, with these. So at Barrows, um, there really are two locations, but I, I think the focus is going to be this one. This is the back of the school here. The location that I think makes the most sense is uh, on the, the blacktop area, which actually when the original designs of the new Barrows school was proposed, um, there was another wing that was looked upon to be built, but was never part of the final design. So the, this, this is uh, you know, in scale, it's two classrooms. We go here, it's on the blacktop, um, right near the curb area. Um, it would give them access uh, to the school, the, the entrance is right here. It's also very close to some of the utilities. This is one of the modules that we could access natural gas, which would decrease our utility costs long term, which is important, versus electrical for heat. We could use natural gas. Um, so this really is um, the space that, that we'd be looking at at Barrows. At Killam, um, it would seem that Killam has a lot of land that we could put modulars, but unfortunately there really is only one area um, that, we, that we can put modular classrooms based on all the factors described. And that is right near the playground area. Um, there's some space in this area here. We cannot put modular classrooms here or here, which is actually where they used to be many, many years ago because of fire, fire code access. Um, the students, these are, these are evacuation routes and uh, the modular classrooms would, 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 be in, would be too close to the, to the exits. So this really is the, the best location um, to put the modular classrooms um, at, at Killam. This is, the, this is Charles Street, just so you know, this is Haverhill. Um, this is the field back here. Oh, then this one. Oh, Joshua Eaton. Sorry. So Joshua Eaton. Um, again, there are two locations, but the ideal location, um, this is the back of the school. There is a, a, a small piece of land before you have the slope going down to the field. 
um, that can put the modular classroom right here. Joshua Eaton is also a school that had modular classrooms at one time. Um, we cannot connect the modular to the school, either at Killam or Joshua Eaton, because it does trigger other um, expenses inside the building, such as sprinklers. Um, at, we would have to build a, a fully sprinkled um, access into those two schools. Um, so again, that would be the most logical place at Joshua Eaton. So I am going to turn this over to Martha. Martha's going to talk a little bit about the bid specifications, um, which would be important in the cost determination. Yes. Uh, so one of the questions that we heard from the Finance Committee uh, last week was just um, some of the more, what are the costs to remove and things along that lines. And originally we had thought that we were going to, um, to separate the bid and purchase the modulars as a, as a good and, and the site preparation separately. And we've talked with a few communities that have ongoing projects or have successfully completed projects, and they really recommended that we, we consolidate the bid and do it as a 149. So um, upon their advice and a few other conversations, we um, took into account your questions about what will it cost to remove it potentially. So the bid specifications will have site preparation and footing and foundation, um, cost to dismantle and remove within five years. Um, and then the different cost options that we've already talked about, the cost to own, the cost to lease, um, and uh, one, they, really, they really are three main vendors when it comes to modulars, and um, one of them says that he's going to have refurbished units available in March, so we thought we might put that in the bid spec as well because that might help reduce our expenses or costs. Um, this has changed subtly from last week after we had AI3 walk through with us. Um, so we met with you on Wednesday and Thursday. We did the walk through with the architect. And he was able to firm up a little bit more the site preparation costs. Um, and then we had uh, initially the presentation we had last week was a little bit low. So um, he estimated conservatively it's about um, uh, $300,000 for the site preparation. So that number has increased from last week when we discussed. Um, we really haven't changed any other uh, expenses on this slide. The, the cost of the modulars, we think they're still going to come in about $121 per square foot. Um, we might get better pricing if then that we're going up to bid versus buying it off the TCPN um, bid list. Um, but conservatively, for the six modulars, it's going to be close to $1.2 million. Um, again, we talked about the lease options, the lease to own. The uh, cost per square foot goes up a little bit more on this one, about $137 per square foot, and that's you know your cost of capital. Um, your fixed costs are going to be the same: your site work, your architectural services, and your your FF&E. Uh, so the the difference, the incremental cost of lease, the lease option is about $77,000. Five years. Yes, five years. So one of the things that uh, John talked about was the estimated full day kindergarten impact. And so right now, um, the, uh, the current class size, if, if no modulars are added, we would potentially be reducing um, the full day kindergarten population by about 80 students. So those students would access either uh, half day or potentially go out of district and come back in grade one. Um, at $4,200 annual tuition, 80 students, that would be a loss of $336,000 of potential revenue to our revolving fund. If those, if we're not offering full day kindergarten, so some of those costs, which um, you asked about earlier, some of those costs do go away. So 2.0 of FTE of teachers would go away, as well as pairs. Um, so the, the budget offset would be $133,000, so the net impact the combined net impact is $202,000, which our FY16 budget uh, has an assumption built into it to our revolving fund. We roll our revolving funds forward um, and you know, estimate. The estimation and the assumption was that we would have the same number of full day kindergarten. So our assumption for our FY16 revolving fund, the balance has revenue for those 80 kids. So that money's already in the yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we would need to be reducing our FY16 budget by another $200,000 or take a significant hit to our, our kindergarten revolving fund. So you built a budget already assuming 80 incremental kids? 
How are we displacing? No, we well the, if you if we go back to John's initial slide, the population of full day kindergarten is the same this year versus next year. They're just all in one part of town, and we've had pretty consistent full day kindergarten numbers. Um, there's also another impact on. Um, on the extended day program. So we have an extended day program that offers before and after school care for, um, for, for students, um, families access this. It has grown to over 400 children. Um, so Sandy Calandrella runs this program and she's done an outstanding job. And um, it's at all five elementary schools. And approximately 22% um, of her population or 30% of her revenue is generated by full day kindergarten kids. So this would also have a, a ripple effect on another program. She wouldn't uh, necessarily be able to fill all those slots if those students um, are not, don't access her program. So there's another approximately $37,000 um, hit on a revolving fund if, uh, if those 80 students go away. Um, the estimated operating costs, um, you know, we did talk a little bit about the one, the grade one teacher at Eaton, which is a restructuring. Um, so that's not an incremental cost. Um, right now, we're assuming that they're all going to be electric heat, although there is probably an option for gas at, at at least the Barrow site. We're not sure about the other two sites. Um, so the estimated cost for heat uh, utilities is about fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars. Um, and we don't have water or sewer estimates at this time. We're not really sure about consumption. Okay. Uh, yeah. Those operating costs, um, so are these newly constructed units, um, Energy Star, will they be using LED lights? And they would be. I mean, they are, uh, that's one of the reasons why this has been tough to, to identify and to nail down because they're going to build to spec, and so the the units that go into them are very efficient, like whether it's heat, uh, whether it's electric or gas. So Mark, the current, the current revenue stream is built on a level among the students that have a, you have a certain expectation of them coming in, they're coming into a different place which you wouldn't be able to accept them to the next program. So then when you do your, your budgeting on the expense side, these are additional expenses that do not currently appear in your budget. Is that correct? This fifteen to twenty-five thousand would be incremental expenses that are not currently in the budget. Correct. And also, water, sewer, and so forth. None of that. Not, everything there does not appear in the current budget as it's been constructed. Is that right? Correct. The, the grade one teacher is in the. The budget. grade one teacher is in the budget. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. But the consumables. Um, yeah. One of, one of the things that we heard earlier tonight from Chad looks like we're going to have a little bit higher than. 2.5%. So some of that additional funding could go to the increase in utilities. Right. Question on the back. Bill. Yeah. If you went yeah. to the lease to own, that's a yearly lease, I take it? Yes. The, uh, the two options that were prevent, uh, presented to us from two different vendors, um, just giving us est rough estimates on what it would be. Oh, okay. Then if you break that down, <coughs> excuse me. For a pupil that can want the need, that could be assessed to the people who want the need. Uh, In other words, the let them right. pay the end of the, 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 the situation. Let them pay for the lease on the building. I, I, I believe there are some uh, Mass General Laws restrictions on, on what we can use that revolving fund, and I don't believe we can use it for capital, but I know Sharon and I, we're going to reach out to yeah, DOI. Can you, can, you can't use the revolving fund for capital. It's a good idea, though. But, <laughs> but we, we actually, we did, we did start to research that, and in our initial responses from DOR were you can't use it for capital. So. Is that a final response? Yes. I, I mean, my initial response was yeah. no, but I can't, yeah. and they said no as well. Question in the background. I, I have a question about just sort of the composition of the revolving fund. Is it, is it my understanding that the revolving fund is just the tuitions that have gone in over time for the all-day kindergarten since we've had it, um, and it pays expenses and it, and it kind of rolls over? Um, if the tuition charge 
is the amount that covers the cost. Shouldn't there be like a zero? In that but it, it's um, the, some of the costs that are baked into the tuition are a percentage of the nurse, a percentage of the principal, a percentage of but support those are staff. Costs that would have, we would have had regardless of all the zero. But those don't go away if the tuition goes away. Those stay. We, we can't suddenly have 99% of the principal. No, we still have 100% of that cost. So your fixed cost of these, these functions is not um, expressed across your permanent, simply your permanent headcount. You're actually taking a portion of those fixed costs against this variable population. Yes. Hmm. So if you don't have this variable population, um, it's a big dent to your, to your fixed cost per head first. Mm -hmm. means that if there, you find a decreasing population over time, you, those fixed costs are still going to be there for all. So this is a, so you know, part of what's going on here is that there's a variable student flow that is positively impacting the permanent expense and should that, should that population, which nobody knows what, you know, that, you know, that population that could have a negative impact on your ability to pay fixed costs. Potentially, yes. Yeah. Let's go back to Barry's comment. I don't understand why the revolving fund would have more than, say, a one-year surplus. In fact, a one-year shouldn't be. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. I'm actually really concerned about uh, talking about this tuition-based uh, public kindergarten. As I mentioned last week, there have been very successful lawsuits in three different states challenging tuition-based OBK. And since then, I have found out that Massachusetts has been called out by name on our practice of charging tuition by the Child Defense Fund, and by the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, as I've showed school card in us. There's a grassroots uh, group here in Massachusetts that part of their mission statement is actually to overturn tuition-based OBK. So I'm not really sure that that's a really secure, you know, financial <coughs> basis for us to be thinking of going forth. Because not only can't you count on state aid, I'm not sure we can count on tuition. And you mentioned that the modules are coming out of free cash. Is this going to come out of free cash also, when we lose tuition? <coughs> There have been states that have actually funded full day K only to find their funding gone. You have Arizona, which is a very red state, but you have Pennsylvania, which is a very blue state. And I think we need, really need to look at this very big picture. This is not really a secure revenue base that we're going into this plan with. Um, I don't know of any active lawsuits in the state of Massachusetts at this well, time, and I'm not aware of that states. group. That the Massachusetts is not, is not one of them. Yes. There are several other communities that have charged tuition and continue to charge yeah, tuition we're, before they can. Yes. Massachusetts has been called out by name on this. Again, I'm not aware of any active lawsuits, and as John mentioned, I, I, I wish we had the graphic, but we're one of, I, want, I don't know the percentage of communities that still charge for, for kindergarten. Um, I know a number of... I think it's in this, it's about seven communities. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. And I just don't know what action we take based on that information. I mean, there's not enough data out there for us to take different strategies. I'm just saying there's legal precedents that you need to be aware of. We didn't see Chapter 7 funding change coming, and the school department certainly couldn't have seen that. But when you have lawsuits in other states, when you have Supreme Courts that actually have said this is unconstitutional, I think we need to pay attention to that. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate yeah. that comment. I do. Um, just to, to sort of balance it a little bit, mm -hmm. I would add that right now in Massachusetts, 85 percent of kindergartners are enrolled in the full day K program, and most of them are not paying tuition. Mm -hmm. So we know that towns like Reading are struggling to find a way to have it be tuition free. Clearly, that's not financially viable, financially viable in our community right now. Um, your point is a fair one, mm -hmm. but the trajectory in Massachusetts, 85 percent of kindergartners in the state are enrolled in the full day program right now. Most are not. Paying that's the trajectory that's being on. So I would just add that as a balance. We know that the state's not going to give funding. In fact, our governor was elected on a platform that basically said, 
he is not going to fund full day care. But surveys are surveys, and if we based all of our financial decisions on surveys, we would have super trash with back. And this this senior center would have a woodworking center. I don't think we should base things just on the survey. I, I don't think we're basing on survey. I think we're basing it on historical and future yeah. data, which shows that since 2005 we've had an increase every year in the percent of families that want well, to live. Kindergarten. Yeah, and and that's pay. what we're using. Yeah. And our pay. I know this kind of topic of raised at different times. So what what are we seeing the alternative? I mean, for us, if I look at where we are right now, the alternative is if we said we were not going to charge tuition because of this climate in the state, we would we would be in a position of only offering half day again. I don't see that there's any other alternative. I, I don't think there's a climate in the state. I, I'm uh, not. Uh, uh, okay. yeah. Right. I, I okay. want to go to a climate like that's hypothetically you're making it. I'm just saying, where would we go anyway? Yeah, there's a comment on the back. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I also appreciate this um, this, this discourse right here. And I'll say that there's a parent who has paid for tuition before they can learn, and on the outside to do it again, and it gets a lot of problems. Um, that, that regardless of where it goes right now, there's a revolving fund there. In my view, and it is now that we do have, there's a demonstrated demand for it on parents and families. Who are willing to pay into it? I, I do think that demonstrates in this town um, a demand for that service and, and, and space that would go along with it. John. A uh, question that hasn't been asked, and maybe it's hard to ask. In an environment of taxpayer paid full day, what's the typical subsidy? I'm going back to Martha's point of this operating cost basis. Is the reimbursement for a taxpayer subsidized? Full day. On what level is that? What is the state? Do you mean Chapter 70? Incremental Chapter 70? If this were taxpayer or? subsidized rather than paid by the parents, what would the what would the per capita reimbursement be? I'm sorry, I'm confused by this yeah, question. Sure. I think you're asking if we get reimbursed. Yeah. 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 The support is to the revenue base, it just goes to a taxpayer base. And that's what we were hoping for, right, John? I mean, when yeah. we first talked about tuition free day kindergarten, our expectation was that our Chapter 70 funding would increase to the point where we could be a one year hiatus. Unfortunately, and, and, it, it, and it was funny at the time, it was no longer funny. Reading makes too much money. Our mm -hmm. Chapter 70 funding would yeah. not increase. And that was about, at the time when we were talking about, about that, about million. a million dollars. Yeah. You recall for this headcount? Yes, for, yes. for approximately this headcount. Uh, what happened is over the course of time, um, Reading as a community, their equalized property value has grown, has increased at a higher percentage than the state average, and at the same time, the per capita income has increased at a higher value, at a higher rate than the state average. And those two factors combined, um, the state actually feels that we're uh, overfunded at this point. And from the, look, yeah, from the looks of those, that graph, I've seen that. Actually. Yeah. And we're not close. No, we're not. There, there's there's a growing disparity between Reading's. Um, perceived ability to pay and, and the, the, the state. Uh, it, it's also why now we only have to get the $25 per student yeah. instead of any additional. $25 mm -hmm. is what, it's the held harmless amount. Yeah. It's a no questions asked number that comes right. in and uh, that's likely from what I've seen all we're gonna ever see. So the two conclusions are the only way, to, the way to make this run better, if I understand you, is to get, make it bigger larger than it is at present over time so that your recurring revenues from this activity can continue to fund the operating budget of the schools as well as expand um, whatever you choose to do in the all day pre-K. You want to make it available to more kids. You're not going to get destated, so you've got to take advantage of your economies of scale and what you're doing here. Mm -hmm. Gary, do you have a comment? I think it was pretty much, well, I guess the, I will make a comment. I would say that what I've seen is uh, a trend nationally to go to full day kindergarten and um, free for the kindergarten. And uh, there's many states that uh, come. Taxpayer that. supported. Taxpayer supported. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. We have used that term free compared to uh, pay. But um, it, it, it's, it's the trend that's going. And the expectations that we have educationally for our children in this day and age, 
Um, we, we really need full day kindergarten. Even what we currently plan to have, I don't think is really suitable. I think we need more than that. Taxpayer-based uh, kindergarten, as opposed to uh, paid. The comment was smart. Sorry, Bob. The question I thought John Arena was going to ask, but he took a right-hand turn. Mm -hmm. um, but Gary just reminded me: if, if you did want to have taxpayer-funded all-day K, we're talking about 100 or 120 bucks for the average household in a year, just so you have that ballpark. What I was trying to figure is to get to the budget if that happened. Mm -hmm. that we look at this a year ago, some of the million costs million. Are, are fixed, though, so it's not quite as big as the all this but there's also a part of it my understanding of the meeting is to sort of make recommendations or think about sort of what we're doing in the next year and I don't, I don't want to be rude or upset people or be disrespectful and just trying to sort of you know realize that time is tight for us all Kindergartners are still kindergartners. They still developmentally need time to play, to learn social skills, to um, experiment, and teachers need that time to give it to them. I think that the state recognizes that. I think beyond that, the educational philosophy and um, the, the educational professionals recognize that. I think that if there are um, challenges to that down the road, then Jim Dwyer has asked for a bill where unfunded mandates are not going to be acceptable. They need to be funded. And if we go in that direction, then the state will need to step up and help. And yes, it comes from taxpayers, but that's for the benefit of all of us. Because the better programs that we have for our kids in kindergarten, the more prepared they're going to be later on the less services they potentially are going to need. And I'm not saying every kid needs full day kindergarten. There are parents that want to keep half day kindergarten, and I'm not judging that. I believe they could have that choice. I did, and I liked it. But I think that if we are heading towards full day kindergarten, if 77% of our families think that it would help them and they're willing to pay for it, and our state is advocating for it, and our educational um, scholars are, and philosophers and practitioners are advocating for it. I don't think that we should be afraid to go to a place that needs to have it. 
And right now, the only way that can happen is with tuition-based. And we've been doing it, and some of the other communities are doing it. I think it would be not a simple lawsuit that should scare us away right now. I, Yeah, just to add on that too, and not to drag it out too much, but in the three years or so I've been on the Finance Committee, this has far and away been the topic people have reached out to me the most. Uh, so I think it is worth sharing. Every single one of those that I have received has been in unanimous support for this decision, which I think speaks to you know the 77% number that's driving that does want this, that does want to pay for it which inherently when you have a group that large that wants to pay for it, where's the driving force from this potential litigation that doesn't exist in our state? It's a great thing to talk about. We should all be aware of it as we go into it. But those are states that are very different than ours. Geographically, demographically, there is unique factors that exist here, one of which is while I appreciate and I am one of the ones paying for it, the $4,200 is not a small amount of money, but when you compare it to the other options, it is a small amount of money. So inherently, who's going to drive that lawsuit? Yes, it's hard to pay that money, but when you look at what your alternatives are, no one paying the $4,200 would be behind that lawsuit. So that's one mitigating factor. Another one is, I don't think we're the type of town that is going to run and make our decisions based on the potential of you know, lawsuits that are existing in other communities that we don't see a pattern. When we see a strong and overwhelming pattern of demand for it, I think the school committee has shown that it is the right move, you know, it is the right thing in the longer term for the education of these students. So I think we have quite a few factors you know, moving forward in support of this. I do think that you know, a healthy discussion makes sense. We should all be aware of what we're going into. Uh, again, a lot of what I'm saying is my view, not finance committee. I know I've wandered off of kind of finance committee and what we're asking to do, but uh, I think it's important. I think the community has been very active and very involved in this, in this topic more than anything I've seen in my time here. And it, it has been, you know, the feedback I am getting is unanimously for it. I know the entire town is not unanimously for it. You can get them to be unanimously for anything. Uh, but I think there's a, stri a driving force there. And I think, you know, like people have reached out so far, I certainly encourage them to continue to do so when we get to town. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, if I could ask a couple of quick questions. Um, John Martha, you brought up the issue of potentially some used modulars. Uh, one of the vendors having that. Do we have any information Third about that? Yeah, um, here, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the three, there, there are really three main vendors in the marketplace that we expect uh, we would anticipate having bids from, and one of the ones that we reached out today saying, you know, there's potentially we're going to have a, a, kind of a bid out there. Um, he specifically asked us if we'd be interested in, in uh, refurbished modules because he's going to have three in his inventory in March which is in the right time frame, and they are of the size and scope that we are we are looking at. So he asked us if, if that's something that we're interested in, then we want to make sure that we write the bid um, to include that option as a pricing option. Do we have a, a flavor for what the cost differential is for you? We do not, no. Uh, do we know are those recently? Yeah, no, we do not. There, there's another community that um, that has a, uh, a a fleet of twelve, if you will, that they've been using that they are going to put out for um, uh, for auction, for lack of a better word. But we're not. We can't count on the timing of that, and, and really the guidance that we received from speaking with a couple of neighboring communities about their ongoing projects and their their past experience. Um, they really recommended we proceed the way we're going. I heard they use the word retro. I don't know if that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> caution. We should look at you know potential uh, as we said cost to dispose of them after the five years because as you can imagine reselling again. If yeah. You're tied yeah. That yeah. Play yeah. Into, exactly. You need to think about what we're going to save up front because you're not selling it a third, and third time on back end. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, one of the things that we did ask Kate, we asked what is the lifespan of a modular classroom. Yes. Thank and you. and it. If you take care of these modular classrooms, they can go for 25 years or more. 
you know, things like repairing the floors and, and the walls and things like that. And, and he, the, the vendor we talked to said, absolutely, if you're maintaining it like you maintain a building, you can keep these for 25 years or more. So. Since one's a FinCon members, we, we had a number of questions last time on other things that we have in terms of we wanted to about move them, specifically these units. We talked about the early thing, we talked about operating costs, yeah. and anything we haven't touched on the show. Uh, the foundation issue, the permanence versus temporary in terms of footings and cost difference and, and yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I believe right now we're gonna go with a, a peer system that is the, the probably the most cost effective and um, either foundation um, is going to be considered permanent. It's not it's not temporary. And, and whatever is built, the building inspector would have to <laughs> approve it. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I could just jump in for a moment. Um, these are considered structures. We have had some preliminary conversations. So all of the codes that apply to a structure would apply to these in other temporary um, classrooms. Thank you. Great. And public safety side, any issues we haven't talked about? Hang on. superintendent brought on AI3 because of the spacing requirements from the schools and other things, um, fire department access, um, they, they come into play. So um, it, it's just too early for, for to have any comments on it just yet. Yeah, I mean, I think those questions are beyond the scope of what we're prepared to discuss tonight, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we, this yeah. was a, you know, discuss the financial aspects of it, not all those. Yeah, understood. I think I... My focus is to make sure that we are thinking about the right things and don't mm -hmm. have some unanticipated we, flip. We met uh, about a week ago with all of the departments that would be involved in something like this and got from them the questions that needed to be answered from their perspective, which we have begun researching. The site plans we received this afternoon, they've been sent to Bob. He's starting to disseminate them to the department heads. So you know they, they now have the site board, will have the site plans. So we'll get more questions as well. We do as part of an article, um, part of two articles. One would be capital, uh, capital budget amendment, and then actually starting against it, and this is on great bunch. Any other kind of general questions? No? Um, so we, we could do a couple things there. One is we could do that discussion right now. If you want to do that in terms of where what our feeling would be, first of all, for, I guess, take up articles four and five, or we want to do that in order. Any thoughts on that, Bob? I just want to ask a question. Um, does the FinCam, FinCom care what the financing is, and would it influence your decision about whether you want to go ahead with calling the town meeting and having a warrant? <coughs> because if it doesn't, then the selectmen ought to go ahead and call the town meeting right now and we can re quickly review the six warrant articles. Um, for those of you that have packets, um, there's an outline on page two. The six warrant articles, and for the selectmen, I'll, I'll, I'll do two hands roll and I'll read the uh, motion. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's an output in the draft warrant report that follows, and the content of the description certainly may change. But the six articles themselves, by themselves, are on pages 17 and 18. And there is some other minor business at this town meeting, if it's called, aside from um, the school portal, but obviously they're the driving factor in articles 5 and 6. <coughs> so if I might uh, read a motion that can be made by one of the selectmen. Uh, move to close a warrant for a special town meeting consisting of six articles for February 23rd, 2015 at 7.30 p.m. at the Performing Arts Center at Reading Memorial High School. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, so now there's a town meeting called, so now okay. go to town. 
and, I, and I would highly recommend you do take care of Article 5 and 6 first. So yeah, that's why I'm going to Article 5 specifically. So Article 5, who's going to get copies? Does everybody have a copy? No. no. Uh, so as usual, we do this in two steps. The first thing that has to happen is any capital program that's going to take place has to be on the capital improvement program list. And obviously, this is something that was not on the list yet. So, somebody want to make a motion on Article 5? $38,000 expense in the capital plan a couple years in the future. Uh, there's a group in town that wants to fund it sooner with donations. Um, by our practice and certainly my preference, I would prefer the town approve the entire amount of the project, which is $40,000. There's $18,000 <coughs> in donations now and they haven't really started a fundraising activity. So if this is approved and going to town meeting, I can virtually assure you by the end of the fiscal year, the full $40,000 will have been returned to the town. So it's somewhat of a placeholder and it's taking care of a future expense. Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? <coughs> That's Article 5. Let's go to Article 6. That's uh, page 13. Let me just try to dispense with some of the other things in Article 5. Um, the Morton Field I've discussed. Every other number on this page is a wash. It has to do with an IRS ruling and collective bargaining. It's just moving money from expenses to wages. So it's net zero. Mm -hmm. Just yes. uh, to make a motion to accept Article 6 as written. And for those in the audience that may not have a copy of it, um, this is suggesting that the entire amount of capital of 40000 from Morton Field and more importantly $1.2 million from modular classrooms comes from free cash. Okay. Discussion? Questions? I'll buy me a test. What's going to be reported? <coughs> it's certainly not binding. How many do you want? Really and, uh, Are there other reserve funds that could possibly be utilized for certainly. this activity? Um, but just so you know, um, and you're probably aware, as you get into other sources of funds, the requirement at town meeting, the bar is raised. You need a two-thirds majority to use it, for instance, from sale of real estate. This is a majority. It's just fair that you know that. But there are, sale of real estate would be the most obvious place. Transfer from the sale of real estate fund if we really wanted to take 
we wanted to spend capital on capital, <coughs> and here we're proposing to just take it out of free cash. Um, the number goes down. Can we? Rep uh, I know you're going to be no. No, we can't. Yes, we can. <laughs> um, free cash. Uh, uh, sale of real estate cannot be put into free cash. Sale of real estate can be put towards a capital project, but it has to be done on the front or in the middle. Like now. Yeah. No. That's an interesting question. Can you do it mid-project? I don't know. No. I don't know if I'd have to ask. ask that I, I think I would expect I would, it to be interesting. I would expect the DR would have a problem with that. But best to make your decision up front, certainly. How much is actually in that account? In the uh, mm -hmm. 700,000? So it's all part of it anyways. So this is, so it's just that this is a capital project. I'm just wondering why, uh, and I don't want to rush this. I'd like to do the project. I'm just wondering we're going to rush to spend free cash, and that money's going to sit there. <laughs> I think the selectmen have a couple of comments. <laughs> it's what, the way to think of it, in my opinion, is one-time money for a one-time expense, and you're done. <coughs> and, and just to reiterate that, right. you know, as many of you know, the term free cash drives me insane <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's not really free cash. <coughs> However, it, it is that money that's set aside for one-time emergencies, one-time opportunities, um, special situations that arise. Um, and one could say that uh, this qualifies in two of those three categories. Um, and so even though, yes, this is, a, this is a, a capital expenditure, the reality is that there is a very near-term situation that has presented itself, number one. And, um, <coughs> an opportunity to solve that problem with a relatively small amount of money as compared with turning around and saying, okay, let's fix kill them. Okay, that's five million. Um, let's fix Barrows. I mean, I don't even know what that number is gonna be. Um, so I think that you have a situation, even though you're working on a capital project, that fits into the framework of why that rainy day money's there. It's to deal with right. special situations and deal with opportunities that present themselves in the short term. Okay, so I'm um, so everyone understands. So this would be, um, we're gonna take $3 million right out of um, our reserve funds. That's what this will do, because that's what we're proposing for the fiscal year going forward. How much? Um, How much? Well, for, for 16, mm -hmm. we've authorized 1.7. That's a done deal. Okay. So we're talking about now is an extra million dollars. Mm -hmm. Or 1.2. 1.2, so, so which I, just 3 million, million basically. In total, one point seven. Yeah, so that's why I just want to be clear. Yeah. So I'm about spending three yeah. million. Yeah. Right, but I, right, I definitely think that the appropriate place for it to come. I actually don't like the idea of the lease because I'm concerned that it could put additional pressures on the operating budget. That's the last thing we need to do. In terms of distribution of where we have money to have spend something that's a one-time expense out of free cash, is, <coughs> dovetails perfectly with what you know we want to spend that account for. Yeah, I'm just having a problem with this because it's not an expense, it's a capital investment. So, I mean, wait. Well, one of the ways to think about it is the alternative. If you take a look at um, the numbers that Martha projected, you're immediately going to create a two, about a quarter of a million dollar shortfall in the operating budget, which you're going to have to make up from free cash anyway. Mm -hmm. no, so, don't misunderstand me. I'm not. I, I'm only talking about um, how we pay for this. I'm not arguing that we shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is, by not doing, I do see what you're I'm saying. I'm not saying not to do it. But <laughs> if you have that kind of a shortfall, you're going to are you going to come to free cash to get that anyway? Because you've got. Yes. So I mean, I think I heard that there was a two hundred thousand dollar plus shortfall that happens anyway. if this doesn't occur. And, and um, free so cash it requires a majority vote to town meeting. Yes. If you start going to other accounts, that's a two thirds majority. Yeah, I think we might get that majority. Well, I, I, I'm raising so my concern. Mark, Mark, just so. just so that those in the room don't misunderstand, while well, while you are calling for a 1.7 outlay of free cash plus the 1.2 here, some of that 1.7 is going to come back. Right. So think of it in terms of the net term. Maybe it's a, a one and a half comes back. So your outlay really is at the end of, of this fiscal year. It's really just the 1.2, maybe 1.5. Yeah, I'd also support the use of free cash. I think it's the right place. I think when we when we budget, we focus on more discipline. 
this is the type of thing that should come from free cash. Uh, I get very concerned if we go to look somewhere other than free cash, while I think collectively we all think this is a good idea, if we go somewhere other than free cash, the burden to get that accepted and get that approved is much higher. Back to your point, if we don't get that, you've got a $200,000 shortfall annually. We, for the most part, have been looking at a five-year term with these, you know, with these modulars. There's a million dollars right there. So there's some, you know, there's some risk. I, I think free cash is is the right use. I'm, you know, as long as you know, typically very shy of using it, and I also hate the term free cash. Yeah. But uh, I do think, you know, that that, that is that is what it's there for. Uh, I guess I'd also make a quick plug. I echo your comments, Paul, on the lease option. It's fine. I, I personally hate the lease option. Uh, it, it's not. It's fine. Uh, well, but. Other comments for pick up? I, I don't like the lease option either. Uh, no one's going to like this idea, but I feel obliged to say it. You can also ask the voters. You talk about a high bar that's a little higher than two thirds of town meeting, but it's a fair comment. You you can ask the voters for one point two million dollars one time, and you can do that for this April, just to put it out there. My, my personal response to that is that we have been asking the voters for a number of. Uh, I'm not projects. suggesting you do it. I'm just telling you. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you know, whatever we recommend here goes to town meeting as its next stop. So town meeting will have its say in terms of what's going to happen, and that's the representation. So Mark, we can't wait until April. For Your April. fallback is free cash. That's why it it all roads lead back to free cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where it come from? It's the construction time that we're going on. No, yeah. yeah. If we don't do it now, we miss the window. And we start the lottery, mm -hmm. and we miss the opportunity. <coughs> I, I just want to add, so with respect to the lottery and the two-thirds, we've heard very clearly at our meetings that people do not want to end up in that lottery. And even when we've tried to talk about how would we execute this if we have to, if we can't get the vote, it becomes very tense in the room and very uncomfortable. So I just want to say I don't think we should make, I, I would prefer we don't make the bar the two-thirds bar, and I really am hoping we achieve the free cash um, proposal and support something. Certainly heard from many residents of Reading in support of this. <coughs> many, many ready for a vote? I was All those in favor of uh, <laughs> Article 6 as written? Yeah. Opposed? And we support 800. Do you have anything else on the warrant that we should look at? Yeah, you should look at some other articles. But the rest of the room should feel free to leave because it's not very interesting. <laughs> You're welcome to stay. Yep, excuse me, just for one sec. There is, in fairness, Mr. Brown has a couple of comments that he'd like to make. I'm sure they're not interested in the cemetery building except when they want to die. <laughs> <laughs> We are not out of fuel. We are not over the ground. Come on down. Thank you, folks, for trying to stay for further discussion. We're also free to leave. We're going to go back to the break.
you got to be dead. you got to pay for it. In advance. In advance. Uh-oh. Bob's PC is doing updates. It's going to take a while. Yeah, please. Phil, are you going to drive that, you that, you drive that the notebook computer? What's that? Are you going to drive that computer? No. You're, doing that. <laughs> You're here for the next two hours. No. Okay. <laughs> Short and sweet, John. Never. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, as you know, the Cemetery Board of Trustees of the Firm and Apple on the springtime meeting asked me for two point uh, two million dollars. Uh, where did the two million dollars come from? That good thing. We met, I met with the board on our December meeting and I came up with a price in a specific site. The members agreed with the idea of putting the article on, but they wanted more of a solid figure. So just before the January meeting, I talked to the town engineer, George M. Burris. And he came up with a $2 million figure based on the estimates they got for uh, redoing New Crossing Road right now. And that was based on a 4,300 to, and he ran it up, uh, excuse me, let me go back a little bit further on that. On May 10th, uh, 2010, the engineering division did a survey of several sites for New Cemetery to, uh, to replace the present building, they determined that a 4,300 square foot building uh, is required. Based on measurements I made this morning on the present building, and there's a little chilly out there, and a storage queue, there is 2,156 square feet uh, of the, or approximately one half of what the engineering has proposed. This does not include two trailers that are stored outside, approximately 400 square feet. And let me say that the building right now is safe. It's falling down, but it's safe for the guys who work with, uh, in part due to the storage cube that we have rented, and in part thanks to Ford Motor Company, the latest truck that we just bought will not fit in the building. So two trucks and one has to stay out, so we've got all that extra space because the guys are having a dance up there. Uh, that's to keep them warm. And then they work so. So, uh, I went to engineering, got the figures, and I don't think we need 4,300 square feet. I think that we can do it for a lot less with a change of some of the ways that they've done it the last 100 years. Um, there's no reason to put the trailers in the building as far as I'm concerned. You can put covered trailers, put the stuff outside, and still have room inside for your mowers in the window when you want them. That will save uh, 200, I figure 200, $250,000 just to house two trailers. And there is ample site, one site, but I won't, I won't go into that one. And as you are aware, the article in the warrant, we can always amend down. And that's the reason we came up with the two million. Uh, it will be my suggestion at our next meeting, which is the February the 10th, and the selectmen are uh, welcome to come. I, I hope. Uh, I'll be there. Huh? I'll be there. Well, if you don't have no more water problems. If I don't. <laughs> well, Kevin was sitting there for our last meeting and had to all of a sudden leave. And, uh, so that's basically what we do. We, we, we do need a building. I don't know if you people have been in it. Uh, I don't know if you know the history of it or not. But the office that is there. Uh, came as part of the property when they bought it in 1925. They paid $685.50 for the land and the building. Uh, the building that they abutted to it was an 1898 tool shed that was in the back of the uh, cemetery. The, so that's 117 years old. The other building we know is at least 90. We don't know how, how much longer, how old up beyond that. The next additions went on in the late 40s. And the newest addition went on in 1961. Keeping in mind, we only had two cemeteries in those days. We have gone up to four. Back in those days, in most cases, they did not have winter burials. Everybody got stuffed in the 
to them until the spring, because it was just impossible. They also did most of the mowing was done by hand. And if you did not have perpetual care, your lot did not get mowed. Additionally, uh, they used to approve funds for custodians to save this grave, and he hired somebody to take care of it. So, but the need is there. The need is there, and I would invite any of you to go up and look at the building. And, uh, we don't feel it's unreasonable. So per the uh, town meeting, last town meeting, and the permanent building committee, of which you are even a strong advocate yeah. of. Well, less money, more for <laughs> less money. That's why he noted that it could be less money. It could be less money, but I think the discussion was two million was a threshold, and that we. Well, the two million the again problem. came from Judge Zamboris and his big. Again, I disagree. I think that we can do it with a lot less space. Um, yeah. Matter of fact, even if it's substantially less, my micro comment and open it up to, to others as well is that it's a substantial investment that is. There is right there. Yep, yeah, there are your numbers. No, that's the that's the building quarry. Oh. <laughs> I didn't make the I didn't um, make the scale. scale model. Model. Got it, got it, got it. You got it. Still have that? You brought it in the select. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this this is a lower because uh, I went back and asked the guys the measurement of the trucks. That's why we we have the 32 feet instead of 28 feet. Yeah. I would, for my part, would suggest that this needs to go in front of the, the building committee, both because number one, the discussion was that as soon as a board takes a vote, it should get in front of. Them. And second of all, in order to assess kind of what, what the options really are, I think that well, needs to weigh in. I, I somewhat agree with that. Uh, I will tell you, when I, my, the other three members have voted the other night, um, disagree with the site that I feel it should be on. And, but when you look, and I don't think anybody in town knows any more about where the lots are in this town, how many square foot and so forth than I do. No matter where you put it, it's going to be in a residential neighborhood. And I don't think, uh, I know the selectmen have looked at consolidating with the uh, New Crossing Road. Right. But the latest method, uh, I think uh, Bob and I got is 22.4 million to redo that down there. And the rendition before this, uh, it was around 16 million. They did a survey, I think they were recommending 52 parking spots. 14, which depended on um, waivers from Coscom. However, they had 65 employees. So you're starting out with 13 parking spot deficit. And, and the other argument I'm going to use for you, too, I know Bob's going to come up, but that's fine. Uh, not one of the other 12 communities that you use for your comparison of, I don't know what it was, uh, had their cemetery building combined with the DPW. Most every one of them have it in the cemetery. That's where the business is. In fact, and, and, and by the way, uh, we, we had 5,000 extension folks because they weren't able to get up and come back. <laughs> <laughs> they only go one way, though. Yeah. Buck? Um, I, I pretty much fully agree with Bill's observations about the facts. And, and as he knows, for years have violently disagreed with his conclusions. Yeah. I see this as part of a large DPW issue. It's you know, upwards of $20 million issue, which is clearly a building committee issue. And I, I couldn't agree more that this needs, this whole issue needs to be dumped in the lap of a new building committee. Uh, the selectmen and I have worked on many other alternatives. Unfortunately, the uh, last March, um, DPW, through their consultant, did a great presentation to the selectmen without a price. It's taken a really long time to get this price. There was an estimate given in July, I think it was 18 million, um, sometime in late December, and I just read it yesterday. I, I trust Bill's number. I read 16 and 19 million. He saw 22. I'm sure he's right. Um, but the point was that the process with the consultant has been extremely disappointing and slow. Um, I met with the trustees, I think it was a year ago last summer. Uh, yeah. Is that about right? Yeah. Um, I explained some things going on and, and some, some derailments we had along the way. And um, they were very kind to give us another use for a long period of time. So I certainly well understand their frustration, the position they're in. And they're absolutely right that something needs to be done. But I do think this is a bigger issue. But I don't think we want to rush out and, and solve this problem when it might have been solved in another way. Um, and 
clearly our consultant, much as they did a nice job in March, is not in my estimation since, for whatever reason. Um, this would be a real good test of a new standing building committee. Get the right people on it, get out and solve the problem. I'll volunteer. And, uh, and we've got volunteers. And uh, as is, you know, was proposed by the bylaw, for those that don't know, um, two members would be added to the building committee, and certainly one of the cemetery trustees should be one of them, in my estimation. Um, that, that's what the board reappoints me. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. When you're still above the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it could well be that the best solution is build a cemetery garage in one of your cemeteries. But I have never seen good evidence to suggest that that's the right answer to me. I'm not satisfied. Right, we or should get fully vetted by the group. But this article will appear on town meeting. It is yeah, very it's right. It's we we up figured that uh, the worst town meeting you can say was no. Yeah, exactly. And, and <laughs> that's been said for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, again, I do apologize and I wish we had a faster answer. Oh, but hey, Bob, well, uh, you and I are still going to disagree on right. location. <laughs> And you're still going to show up in my office every day. No, <laughs> and they're not for well, the, um, the ombudsman you have to see now. Where, 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 where is that? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to hit Jeff? Where, where is the new Peter's ombudsman? old office area, down next to the town clerk. Oh. The door's locked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, thank you. So that's, that's, that's the pitch. We, we need a building. There's no question yeah, about I it. I don't disagree with that at all. Yep. So this will, uh, when we get to the April warrant, this will be on the warrant. Okay. Could you take a couple of modules? <laughs> 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 yeah. You know what? Maybe for the winter. I got a great module. <laughs> I can put you in today. Uh, uh, cold he's got to move the desks out of the way. He's a bad guy. There's a lot of history on that, too. We sat in the 1973. That's a new one. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot we're on TV. See you. Yeah. That's, the that's the million, two, right? Yeah, 121 dollars per square foot. No, I that's, think that's if it's anything more than car barns, you know, we're talking 800 grand for a size of the world. Yes, to the no, these are stick to it. They're not a uh, sheet metal like that. Right. right. Well, yeah. yes and no. They, they go all the way up to brick and mortar for the last 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of it's amazing what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it is. Library last week. Um, Wall Street decided yes, a package so that was higher coupons, so they paid us a premium. So 3% coupon, but it was a 1.5% yeah, yeah. deal. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. like paid 116 yeah. cents on the dollar to get that increase up for their 116 yeah. cents. Yeah. The only kick kickoff is that the center wall. So as a result, the $10 million we truck. sold to the library had a $1 million premium. Mm -hmm. Now, if we did nothing at all, we have to return, we have to amortize that premium and return it to the taxpayers if you will, because this is excluded debt. We have another option, which is not used that commonly, but in this case, I think it's a great idea, which is to lock in the funding on that million dollars now, and this is the technical way to do it. Either we borrow the million at the one and a half percent through this article, or we don't do this article, we bother borrow the million in two years. I'd rather borrow it now. So that's the long and short of what this article is. So um, because it's excluded debt, we effectively has to ask, we have to ask town meeting to reduce the borrowing authorization because otherwise we could borrow more than what they've really authorized by keeping that premium. Uh, so this is a mess. So, so it's complex, but it's, it's, it could be summarized you know, in that simple fashion. So we actually, we're trying to borrow 10 and a half? We've already borrowed it. The question is whether we keep the premium or have to return it to the, uh, to the taxpayer. Okay. And I would like to keep it as part of the uh, permanent funding. So we borrow 10 and a half and 11 and a half million. We borrow 10 and a half and 11 and a half million. Okay, got it. Okay, so we actually have 11 and a half million. Right, I would like to keep the 11. So I'm going to borrow less in the future. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's correct. We changed the article that Tony had approved. Is that implied? The motion would make that clear. This, okay. this doesn't, but the motion says yeah. reduce the borrowing by 900, whatever that number is. Okay. So instead of authorizing 18.4 million, it's, it's almost a million dollars less. Okay. That's what the motion says. I'm not uh, really disagreeing with this, but our debt service is going to be higher mm -hmm. in the meantime. Um, in the, the next six months, it will be. Not, not really that much. 
We're going to have to borrow the money anyway yes. because yes. construction is underway. We'll need all the money very soon. But if we're borrowing temporarily until the project's done, we'll pay lower than 1.5% interest. So in that sense, you're right. So the debt service is going to be a tiny bit higher in the first year and then much lower for the next nine years. Uh, it's still an effect of one and a half percent. That's the important number. That's all that matters. Okay. If I told you the longer answer, you'd go screaming. <laughs> where, where, <laughs> does that, where does that million dollars show up? What do you mean? Is it showing up as uh, so that we have eleven million dollars sitting in the in we the have bank eleven million of cash, if you will, right now. Right? Um, Sharon will have to set up her accounting to return a million of that. If we do not, right, we'll only keep 10 million because that's really what was all the time. If this is approved, she'll set up her accounting differently to keep all of them. All of them. It's, it's all bookkeeping. Okay, and it is basically as um, excluded debt available for projects. If this were inside the tax levy, I wouldn't even be having this discussion with you because it's Prop 2.5 to guard against that. But because this is extra money, we want to make sure we're not stealing from the taxpayers effectively. So this is the way the DOR set up this rule, which makes sense. It's complicated. But it so really, the, the question to you and the town meeting is, borrow the million now at 1.5%, mil or we'll borrow the million in two years and I don't know what percent. It's really that simple. Right. Does this sit in an interest-bearing account so that we can yes. check so we can check the one and a half down to net three quarters? And the interesting part of this, that we do not um, yes. tax exempt borrowings can earn money for the general fund. Never understood that. Oh. Here. Oh. Interesting. Yes, it is interesting. Not a lot in this case, but if interest rates are seven percent, it'd be interesting. So back to Peter's point just for a sec. So we would if we returned the premium and then came back, it would be two years before we came back to get that extra money? Probably. Uh, when the project is fully closed out. Because we won't know our total cost to do the last piece of borrowing until the project's done, which is best case April of 16, 2016. Add another few months, you know, we're talking about 18 months from now, maybe two years. So we're talking the, the swing is fifteen or twenty thousand dollars of, of of interest, one and a half percent of a million know. bucks. That's what it would cost, yes. but who knows what it might right. cost in a couple of years. Sorry, right. I'm flocking in 1.5 million. Yeah. I mean, although it's complicated, there's no downside to approving this article. All you're doing is saying the town can borrow less for the project. And if that if we're okay with that, you would think everyone else would be. I moved to comment. Mark, doesn't this open up the prospect of potentially funding the last tranche if you chose to out of free cash in say four years when the library is done? You're um, so close to 13. Yes, we have that option regardless of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this just makes it easier. You know, we've borrowed some percent of the total now permanently, which is why I didn't want to borrow the whole amount, forgetting about this complication. Right. Right. There's always the option to pay the rest off from any different source. Of this just makes yeah. it easier. But it is now yeah. excluded. It may not be if you choose to do it in a different way. Okay. Yeah. And the other issue at that point is that the free cash available to spend on this kind of thing. Yeah. You have the right. You have the right, but not the obligation. Exactly. Right. I got my questions answered. Move to adopt Article Three as drafted. All those in favor? Opposed? <coughs> Article Four is substantially easier. Uh, last uh, spring, the town meeting authorized six hundred thousand to take from Chapter Ninety. Now we just have to increase it to the nine hundred thousand dollars a year. Yes, it's yeah. very happy. Actually, they both are, but the other That's one is only a few of us understand. <laughs> happy if you can understand it. <laughs> As Karen yeah, said to my comment about the bond sale, you, you still like this stuff, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't know. We have a motion second to second the call. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Do you guys want to assign reports, and hopefully this time I'll remember? Yeah, we'll write them down. Let's get them all in order.
<laughs> so, who um, wants to take Article 3? Unfortunately, did not send my updates to. I'm <laughs> sorry. I have them. I'll, I'll send them over to you. So I, I would suggest we not do minutes right now. That's right. Any other business? Any other business you guys want for us? <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion. We're done. We're done. Have a second. I think that was in the Opposed? Opposed? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah.